Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. The text for today, the second Sunday after Pentecost, June 19th, 2022, are Isaiah 65, verses 1 through 9. The alternate first reading will be 1 Kings, uh, chapter 19, 1 through 4. You can go uh, include 5 through 7, uh, and that would allow us to go from 1 through 15a. And then the psalm is 22, 19 through 28. And Galatians chapter 3, 23 through 29. And our gospel is Luke chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Lots of, lots of texts. Yes. With the alternate readings, we're going to have a few. And I'm going to say already, I'm already missing Ralph's voice this week with the Old Testament uh, text that we have. Yeah. Yeah. He uh, frequently comes through with those witty insights of his with regard to the Old Testament. So, yeah, that's one thing that we want to remind our listeners about is that we now embark on that alternate first reading uh, for the summer through the season of Pentecost. And so when we get to that, we'll probably have some insights with regard to how to how to move through that. And then also uh, we're back in Luke. We've been in John for a long time. Uh, been through the Easter season, through Pentecost and Trinity a Sunday, and now back in back in Luke. So we kind of want to, I think it's a helpful moment at this point to just remind yourself of, okay, what is Luke about? What, what am I, what do I need to pay attention to? Where have I been uh, now that we're here in chapter eight? And so, yeah, just a couple of basic reminders, right? Before we get going on the specific texts. Indeed, to set this uh, context again for um, this uh, entire a new approach to hearing the story of the life of Jesus and the encounters that those who walked with him ex experienced. Yeah, so Luke, should we start with that? Let's start with Luke. Great what story. I... Go ahead. Oh, great story. Uh, it's, you know, it's a, a story that sets up a lot of really uh, important, uh, well, reminds us of some important themes in the Gospel of Luke. This is the first time that uh, Jesus is also in Gentile territory, which I think the commentary mentions, and uh, which I think, you know, maybe might be kind of a su surprise. I think we kind of assume that Jesus is already been there, but this is the first time. And what does this, and that's just another layer of the, of this encounter of, with, with this uh, tormented man and, and the level of then transformation that happens with him. And so uh, that's the one theme I want to highlight here is, is that just extraordinary transformation on, on his part of, you know, being possessed, naked, out of control, living with the dead, and then goes at the end of the story uh, to being saved, clothed, and in his right mind. And uh, and just to maybe sit with that a little bit, that, it, that an encounter with Jesus leads to this kind of transformation. And, uh, and what does that mean? And of course, he also ends up being, uh, ends up being in many respects, a disciple, right? Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And so that this, this uh, unusual encounter in a far off land, that even the gospel can reach that far. And of course, we know that from, we know that from the beginning of the gospel, but also going into Acts. And so uh, just to, just to sit with that kind of impossibility, right? One of the themes of Luke, right? Nothing is impossible with God, that God can reach even this person and, and affect this kind of uh, an extraordinary transformation, I think could be one homiletical theme. I appreciate that uh, uh, recognition of uh, transformation 
And uh, this idea of being in a strange land is a part of what we, uh, is a part of that context of Luke, of uh, being in uh, the, the several texts over the next few weeks will take us among a different group of people, a different group of Jews, and obviously into Gentile territory. And uh, to, to keep that context before us. But Caroline, I, I, I'm with you in terms of the homiletical focus being that an encounter with Jesus results in radical transformation. And in the midst of the context that we are living in, one thing we're all pretty sure of is that we're ready for something uh, that is incredibly transforming. Um, we seem to be ourselves living among the dead, whether they are dead ideals, dead hopes, the reality through the pandemic of lives lost, of, of, of friends and family members who are no longer living with us, um, the, uh, the idea of loss and death uh, and what it means to linger and lament in the midst of that, to be chained to that is very, very real for us. And so telling this story in a way where we are able to recognize those feelings and that disruption um, in a way that kind of allows us to step out of our reality and see it from a, a, a different perspective. I think that's the gift of storytelling. And then as we move through the story to actually experience that this encounter, as you said, um, this transformation results in a witness for Jesus. And to remind ourselves that when we are encountering Jesus, ultimately, that is what these stories of the people of faith is always about, is that it makes us what it means to be fully human, image bearers of God, those who bear witness to God showing up in the worst places and transforming them into the most beautiful places of hope. So, so I feel bad. Um, following you two on this, um, <clears throat> at risk that I'm going to start pouring cold water over a, a lot of it. It's such a disturbing passage in so many ways, I, um, because it speaks the truth, I think, about human society uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, and I want to be careful about Jew-Gentile distinctions, because he has encountered Gentiles in chapter 7, Gentiles live all over the Western Shore as well. But so, I mean, before we, like, try to before a preacher might think the gentile world is somehow you know this horrible place defined yeah. by this man's experience it's not but i mean he, oh. he's transformed and you both are absolutely right but nobody wants the transformation except for him exactly and jesus everybody else uh, either resents it or at least is utterly terrified by it because they had a deal they had a system worked out right we chain him up and that keeps us safe and maybe it keeps him safe in their twisted logic. And, and now he's no longer mm -hmm. um, chain upable or shouldn't be chained. You know, it's, it just speaks to so many ways in which society, um, and I know it's a really general term, right? But tries to control the things that scare us or the people and out of sight, out of mind. And this person is tormented by this massive number of unclean spirits, but the torment is multiplied by a society that does not know what to do with him. Right. Well, that. Um, so okay. find, if you, can find, if you can't find a parallel anywhere with that, then I can't help you, but yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, that was, that was my next uh, comment that I was going to make in that, uh, it, it, and there it is in verse 35, uh, where they find him, right, sitting at the feet of Jesus, a, a, a discipleship place, uh, a follower of Jesus' location, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And so I have a big circle around that, around that phrase. Uh, to that's the other place that, the, as you are naming Matt, that a preacher needs to sit and say, what is what is what is the reason for that fear? Uh, and and really press that. And you've named a number of of those reasons uh, already. 
but that what what is what is the origin of that fear where is it coming from and 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 why and again why fear uh when when you're you've just witnessed a transformation and so it really it absolutely speaks to that response to what's happened to the man absolutely speaks to that uh that undercurrent of the human condition that uh that is fearful of what now they can't control and uh and and what mm -hmm. bodies <laughs> they they can't control right. and at one level i think we have to assume they're they're doing what they assume is best for the man to protect mm -hmm. him from himself to protect you know so there's a lot going on you know we'll talk about freedom with galatians 3 obviously it's juneteenth there's just a lot going on with some of these texts around uh, control and superiority, dominance, bodies, all of that. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what that that's that's uh, the um, that's why I wonder if the story can be told so that um, so that we lean in and allow ourselves to judge our own very practices. Um, so I I totally appreciate uh, Matt what you are naming and would not want an apology to be made by the preacher as they, they name this, because this is what we are still doing. This is not a past human practice. And because of the resurrection, we don't do that anymore. This story confronts us because we still, we, not they, we still do that. And to, to tell the story in a compelling way so that we recognize our own behaviors, not so that we identify, um, it, 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 it's really nice to be able to say. Oops, we lost Joy there for a second. Yeah, we did, yeah. You want to try to predict what she was going to say? Story. I'm in it right now where we might. Oh, we lost you for a second there, Joy. We lost you for about five or 10 seconds. Oh, probably because I was confessing that I am the one who is. Am I gone again? No, no, no. Keep. You got it. Oh, you were, okay. We want to hear. We want to hear your confession. My confession. Now, maybe I'm being saved from myself. No, to I, I'm just confessing. Uh, I had. Uh, approach this story as the one who was set free, but um, I am now reading it in the one who is practicing the control, the one who is trying to keep others in their place out of my desire to take care of them, which is really a desire to keep myself safe, and then being frightened by what I can't control. And so the words that strung out for me was that we are fearful of what we don't know or what we don't understand, whether that is uh, the demon possession or the miraculous transformation. Each of these are frightening because we don't understand. Mm -hmm. and. I would hope that the preacher would take that moment to name that reality a half step away so that the listeners would be able to lean in and say, oh, maybe I'm not the one who is being freed. Maybe I'm the one who was the cause of someone's being chained and in both ways be transformed. Yeah, okay. Speaking of things we can't understand, why I say it's 65, one through nine. <laughs> yeah, my that was my that was my segue. <laughs> oh, so sorry. <laughs> no, it's I, the, I think it's the echo. I think it's the echo of all of the things that are troubling. <laughs> yeah, it, I, maybe. I'm, it, I'm just going with who sit inside tombs. I yeah. that, that's my connection there. <laughs> I hope that's not the reason, but yeah, it's it's so it's this is a it's a tough, Isaiah 65 is a tough passage on its own, just, um, right? It's this movement from God painting the people as just awful, <laughs> it's just as his miserable human beings. And then, you know, so I'm going to judge them, which, you know, this is how it works in, <laughs> in the Bible. But then, you know, this, um, <laughs> it's so bad, but then finally it's like, 
I'm not going to destroy them all. I mean, it's like, that's the, that's the turn at the end toward like, woo. Um, but even the woo is just like, I've decided not to destroy them all. <laughs> it's just, I don't know. It's just such a, it's a very harsh passage, but the way it paints people as utterly unconcerned about the ways of God mm -hmm. is striking as well. And maybe that's the connection, right? A way to, you know, the the language here of of rebellious people uh, and and how that rebelliousness is actually also embodied in the Lucan text. And so that could be, I mean, it could the Isaiah passage could give a little bit of more language or uh, precedent, if you will, for our our resistances to the presence of the kingdom of God. Which is striking, right? I mean, the, the Luke text doesn't exactly say this, but we might infer that these are people who actually resent the man's healing. I mean, at one level, I mean, they're, so at one level, do we resent God's ability to come and transform systems? And why do we prefer living in, you know, in our own systems. social filth? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the familiarity of what we can control, even imperfectly. So we know things are not the way they should be. Uh, if we go back to the Luke text, um, this man is out of control. And our way, our limited way of taking care of him is uh, putting him out of community, locking him up, looking at him strangely. Um, I'm taking some hyperbole in, in trying to describe what it means for him to be out there in need of uh, this transformation. Um, but if we take the whole of Isaiah, the Isaiah co corpus, what it means for God to be present is inclusive of caring for the least. It is inclusive of being attentive to our neighbors. It Isaiah is the whole of the law uh, of, of Israel in terms of where the people fail to practice what God has called them to be. And that is why they are being judged. And so, um, uh, Caroline, I think it was, you just said that this could give us some context. I believe so. Um, it's the context that the first century uh, persons who encountered Jesus, who knew Israel's stories would know, that there is a God who has a high standard that includes others. And in some ways I'm leaning beyond this text uh, till we get to Galatians, but who, who is including others and the people are radically failing. And God will not let that stand without judgment, but God never gives up. And that's that twist at the end mm -hmm. is that I'm not gonna completely destroy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we've got this alternative reading right now that we're uh, Old Testament reading that we're moving through for the season of Pentecost, and and so one thing that as I was look you know looking forward in this is obviously that the focus is on the prophets, and so you we've got we've got Elijah here, we'll get Elisha, and then going forward we'll have a couple. Sundays on Amos, we'll have a couple Sundays on Hosea, we'll have a few Sundays on a, uh, a Jeremiah, more in Jeremiah, so we're moving through the prophets. So one thing I, 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 well, two things, one thing a preacher might consider is maybe this is the summer of the prophets, and you just, and you, and you just move through these texts and talk about uh, talk about each of these prophets and and expand you could expand that in various kinds of Bible studies and and uh, and get a sense of what were the to what issues were these prophets speaking and such. But also, I think a larger context for this is helping people think about what prophecy is. Uh, and what the prophetic books were about. Uh, and because I think there's a lot of misconception about what the prophets were about or resistances. And fundamentally, it's resistance against the kind of truth telling that the prophets were about. But I'll never forget, and I teach this um, often too in my, in my foundations of preaching class, but that Abraham Heschel talks about prophets being uh, imbued with divine pathos. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. we have this, we have this really unfortunate right now, sort of bifurcation of you're either a prophetic preacher or you're a pastoral preacher. And that's just not right when it comes to the prophets. They're, they're, they, it's, it's from this divine pathos that they speak truth. And so that's just one, well, two, okay, two, two, uh, two suggestions before we even get into the story. But um, as the preacher is planning out uh, their, their summer preaching, that might be something that you want to help people think about. Can I say one more thing on that too, just kind of in terms of the where the semi-continuous lectionary is taking us, that yeah. it might also be helpful to kind of set the prophets historically for people. Yeah. Um, there's always been prophets, right? So you've Miriam, Eldad, Medad, Nathan, I mean, Samuel, Nathan. So there, I mean, there's been prophets before, but for the most part now, we're deep into kingship. So just that people know we're way past the Exodus, we're way past David. But the, the rise of prophets comes in the midst of a lot of political intrigue. It comes in the sense of how do kings kind of cement their own authority as God's representatives and how is a lot of the prophetic critique back over against, especially the powerful, those who have the capacity to shape society, just so that people kind of get a sense like sociopolitically what's going on. Mm -hmm. But I love also the Heschel stuff, right, where he talks about the prophet's own body mm -hmm. being incredibly important. And we'll get to that in just a second, where we see Elijah's own body mm -hmm. failing him in some ways, or it's just overwhelmed. He's so overwhelmed by the, by the work, but that so that we don't just see the prophets as these messengers who mm -hmm. are kind of these personality less oracles on behalf of God, but it's, it's always these deeply embodied messages or this pathos that you mentioned, but mm -hmm. anyway, I like summer of prophets. That's going to draw people in. Yeah. That's, that's just gonna make be sure you problem. spell prophets correctly. <laughs> prophets. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Very good. point. Uh, yeah. Good. Cause if you just hear it, it, you, you could draw a crowd, but <laughs> not the crowd that wants to hear this truth. Yeah. 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 Well, Amos will take care of that in no time. <laughs> yeah. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, Jeremiah probably will as well. But uh, yeah, and Will Willimon uh, also has a great line about prophet, the prophets that the first prophetic move is tears, mm -hmm. uh, and and that that you know the the reason for this truth telling <laughs> is uh, for the sake of relationship, uh, maintaining relationship, and the way in which. You know, going back to some of our previous themes already in the podcast, but the way in which uh, we seem hell bent on not maintaining that relationship with God, and God keeps, God keeps, God keeps keeping on to maintain that, and the prophets end up uh, being uh, uh, serving a major role, right, in that in that maintaining. Anyway, Elijah. That's a perfect segue uh, if if we jump further down into the questioning, because um, and I'll, I'll back up to say something about uh, just the opening. But um, th this question uh, of where uh, Yahweh becomes central in asking questions um, in, in terms of where are you uh, echoing? Uh, what are you doing here? Uh, what are you doing? Um, I, we always find when God shows up, God who knows the answer gives us a chance to say from our perspective, what are we experiencing? And um, that beginning here uh, where when we turn the attention away from the individual prophet and focus back on the presence of God the entire reading changes. And uh, so um, I, I appreciate you saying that, Caroline. I said, I'd, I said I'd back up in terms of just this recognition that the adversaries that uh, are listed here are real. Mm -hmm. The circumstances that, that uh, Elijah is in are real. And uh, you know, when you start lamenting, when you start complaining, when you start uh, announcing your fears or acknowledging your fears, um, they're just because they're incredulous doesn't mean they aren't there. It doesn't mean that they're not real. And uh, so, yes, as Willimon would say, to begin in those tears, but to be sure to uh, turn that. Um, 
we have to um, recognize also, I think a place to go with this is we as humans have a tendency to want to tear down others' idols. And um, those Id their idols that we tear down, we tear down in the name of God. And for me, homiletically, I would linger there. Um, in, in the aftermath of the conversation around Roe v. Wade, in the aftermath of the um, various uh, disruptions around how do we uh, acknowledge June 19th and the history there, people on both sides of issues are going to um, are, are going to want to tear down everybody else's God, everybody else's idol. And so this, this doesn't, if it's truth telling, it doesn't have to be siding with a particular pol political statement, but rather it becomes naming where we have put our hope in something less than the creator God. And then to turn the attention to the fact that God is present and saying, what are you doing? What are you doing here? I think, um, <clears throat> well, the commentary on the website for this passage is great. It's just full of insight. I learned a lot from it. Some good homiletical suggestions there. Uh, I hate to do this, but part of me wants to go to verse 18, just so it can be named that part of what Elijah discovers in the midst of this is that um, there is still a remnant that indeed he's not the only one left, even though he's convinced he is. And so part of the good news is you don't see the whole picture. You don't see all of what God is up to. Everything else Elijah says is legit, right? The exhaustion is legit. The despair seems to be legit. I mean, this is, and he's about to get replaced. That's part of it too. It's probably not because he's worn out, but you know, but the, the reminder is God still has faithful people. God still is up to something which is of course incredibly difficult to see when you're in an Elijah kind of moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And maybe uh, I'm going to, if there's, if maybe we could transition to the Psalm then in, sure. in this regard, because that's. Can I, say, can I say one thing about the sheer silence and, and maybe we can go back if, if you want to make the segue to, to Psalm. Yeah, no, go I, ahead. Yeah. It, it's it's so familiar, and I really appreciate that we haven't made that portion of the text central in this podcast, because for so long, that has been what people have preached or have studied or heard about, so that we've missed uh, communicating all that we've talked about here and, and, and uh, even that is in the, in the commentary. But if the perspective is to talk about that, Here's a line I'd like to offer, and that is a, a reminder that the silence isn't God. It is the silence that causes Elijah to step out. And so my line is that the silence of God is when we notice what we cannot handle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Take us to the psalm. Oh, well, I was, uh, I don't know that I, well, I wouldn't preach on the psalm. So <laughs> plenty of other things, that, but, uh, but it, it, for me, the segue here was the, the way in which, uh, the way in which you, the psalmist, uh, is speaking what Elijah, you know, what Elijah fears, right? But you, O oh Lord, do not be far away. Um, come quickly to my aid. And so it can be language that uh, that Elijah speaks, right? So that's all I have. That's it. That's all I got. For me, the place in the Psalm is the promise that's there. And uh, a reminder that the reason we tell the truth, and this circles all the way back to that pastoral heart of the truth telling prophet is that ultimately what this is about is to, to proclaim this promise of God um, that the poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek shall praise the Lord. It, this promise I think needs to be lifted up as the reason 
why we are telling the truths that we're telling. We're not wanting to go back to Isaiah simply to tear down the idols of the other so that we can say, my God's bigger than your God, because that means we've made an idol of our own truths, but that we are making a way for everyone to see that God is, that God is faithful to God's keeping God's promises, and that we are not the only ones that are pointing that out to the world. And the yeah. power of the dog is one of the ways in which God actually saves and redeems and comforts God's people. So <laughs> the dog gets a bad rap in this psalm. <laughs> That's right. Saying. All right, Galatians. We, let, we will go on to Galatians. We've got three Sundays in a row on Galatians mm -hmm. and three really like gems of passages. So uh, you, you've got, I mean, it's the, it's the uh, top three of the Galatians passages for sure. So a preacher definitely wants to read forward and see that uh, you, you, as the commentary talks about, you, you'll want to put context around Galatians. And uh, as she, as Carla says, Paul is livid and for good reason. Uh, and so that urgency there in, in Galatians and, and I think setting that urgency then makes what these passages really pop. Uh, but I'm going to like go rogue again. Uh, so some are the prophets. And uh, and so reading far forward in Galatians, I was like, what if you did a ser sermon series on the fruits of the spirit, which is next week. So uh, that's my, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm in my office and I have a plaque. And so I'm like, oh yeah, maybe you should do fruits of the spirit. But uh, but that could be an interesting sermon series too, or maybe like a like a supplement this summer where we get that passage. And it's so it's such a important passage and well known passage. Uh, you might want to spend some time there. So, or what would it mean? And we can we can speak more about this when uh, uh, next week when we get there. But what would it mean if on um, the fruits of the spirit are in our imagination as we are telling. The, the stories of the prophets, um, asking the question repeatedly, where is uh, the fruit that is being called for actually what the prophets are actually naming as absent or challenging the, the uh, people to uh, enact? Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be a way to merge those together, but to take advantage of the opportunity uh, to tell the story of the prophets. But in some ways, tell the story why. What, what, what would be the reason that this truth telling is necessary, that this call to accountability is necessary? And that's what Paul is doing here. Paul is being um, the pastor who is doing the prophetic truth telling. He is calling against all of the structures of society that have become um, wonderful ways for people to divide themselves. And he is saying, in Christ, something brand new occurs. A transformation happens so that those barriers that society would like for us to live in are struck down because we have a new identity. And that is our belonging to Christ. And on June 9th, in, on Juneteenth Sunday, um, to be able to make that central um, may be a very powerful word to be heard across every pulpit. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I want to go rogue too. And I want to say, don't read any scripture at all this Sunday, but this one, that'll give you more time to preach on it. Just, mm -hmm. I would drop everything and, and say, you know, yes, the, the church year has not allowed you to spend time in Galatians 1 and 2. No worries. Just do work on Galatians three and help people unpack the um, <laughs> excuse me the the context that you're just talking about, Joy, of what Paul is getting at. This idea of all of these advantages or hierarchies dissolving in terms of their importance when we're in Christ, but to wonder together with a congregation, what kind of trajectory does this set us on? What kind of trajectory is Paul pointing us toward? People criticize Paul all the time for not living into the ideals that he states here. Um, 
guess what the people 2000 years from now are going to say about us not living into those ideals. But how do we, I mean, but just to imagine with people, right? This is, this is um, illustrative, representative, suggestive. This is not everything. So what does it look like to continue to see the ramifications of the gospel in terms of the transformation of how we assign value um, to one another, to ourselves, and how that all gets obliterated in Christ? I'm not willing to give up on Paul because, because these words are here, hope exists. Because these words are here, the barriers are broken. Because Paul spoke these words in Galatia then, we have a, a challenge to live differently. And uh, Matt, I think you're absolutely right. Um, we can say Paul didn't do enough to dismantle slavery, but 2,000 years from now, if Jesus Terry, people are going to look at us and say, well, you had all of these writings and what did you do? I think, I think that's a powerful word that you, you just named. And um, so I'm, I'm not willing to say Paul was bad. I'm willing to look at this and say, this is, these are the seeds for dismantling sexism and racism and classism because that was the comfort of this society. And here Paul names it.